You're watching Woman Without Limits. Don't let what you've done hinder you. Hinder you. Don't you let where you've been hinder you. Don't let what they've said hinder you. Hinder you. Don't you let your past hinder you. You're a woman. But here's what I know, that that dream that you're holding in your mind, that it's possible. See, sometimes we can't say, I can do that. But what we can say, that it's possible that I can have my dream as we run toward it, as we work on it day in and day out. along to Jerome McGinley. Crosby scores! It's over! The goal! But people who are running toward their dreams, life has a special kind of meaning. I was willing to take a chance, and most people won't do that. Most of the people that you talk to to try and bring them into the business, these are not risk takers. Most people have done all that they're ever going to do. They raise a family, they earn a living, and then they die. You are going to incur, incur a lot of disappointment a lot of failure, a lot of pain, a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. But in the process of doing that, you will discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. What you will realize is that you have greatness within you, that you are more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine you are greater than your circumstances. The other thing is that most people, ladies and gentlemen, they get comfortable. They stop growing, they stop working on themselves, they stop stretching, they stop pushing themselves. For you're running toward your dream, I applaud you for believing in yourself. Because that's what life is about, stretching and challenging. Looking for ways that you can begin to improve yourself. Do it. Your dream is possible. Do it. People who are unstoppable and unreasonable, people who are refusing to leave life just as it is and who want more.
You're welcome to Woman Without Limits. My name is Reverend Kathy Kuna, and it's always such a delight to have you welcome us where you're watching us from. Now, Woman Without Limits has been life transforming, and we thank you for all the feedback that you bring our way and let us know how we truly are affecting your lives. And that's what we are all about. We want impact. We want to impact lives. We want to change lives. We want to transform lives because that's what Woman Without Limits is here for. Now, every time we bring diverse stories of different men and women that have gone through situations and have come out of them to let you know that even you can come out of any situation. It doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter whether you're sick in your body. God can heal you. It doesn't matter whether you're walking in poverty, God can turn your captivity around. It doesn't matter whether you're really believing God for a husband, God can do it. It doesn't matter where your situation is. It doesn't matter whether it's your past, your background, God can absolutely turn your captivity around. I'm Reverend Kathy Kuna, and I know that today you're going to have an awesome time. We're going to be looking at something that's really a pandemonium. I might, I might as well call it that. It's really a pandemonium all over the world, across the board. I mean, if you go to China, they have the same issues. You go to America, they have the same issues. You go to, to UK, you go to Australia, everywhere you go, they have the same issues. And this is the issue of self-esteem. And uh, let me just tell you something. Self-esteem is a disposition that a, a person has which represents their judgment of their own worthiness or unworthiness. It is the positive or negative evaluation of oneself, how one feels about him or herself. According to a research done by Dove Self-Esteem Project, 47% of young girls deal with self-acceptance and the most common being bodily image. They just don't like their image. And that is 47% of women. Can you believe that? And then in another research done by Jennifer Crocker, a psychologist at the University of Michigan Institute for Social Research, people who base their own self-worth on what others think and not on their own value as human beings might pay mental and physical price based on that because of a low self-esteem based on what other people think about them. We're going to hear a story of this wonderful, profound woman that everybody loves in Kenya. She is Kanze Dena. Now, this is one of the top Swahili anchors in one of the uh, Kenyan television stations. Her excellence as an anchor has seen her rise from ranks to, or to, to even becoming a news director and a producer. She is an amazing woman and she shares her journey with us of how she battled so hard with self-esteem. And for her to be able to climb how far she has climbed, somebody is about to get blessed today. You better buckle those safety belts as you welcome with me Kanze Dena on set. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy. You mean you speak English also? Mm. Eh? Nilisomaite. <laughs> 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 wow. Lakini kwa katika katika kazi yangu najiita kama Kanze Dena, jina la kiasili la kutoka uh, kikundi ama kabila la Waduruma mm. ambao wanapatikana Kwale. Wow. Mm. Oh my god, give it up for Hawa Musa. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was telling her I could actually interview her in Swahili, <laughs> but she will embarrass my Swahili. So we might as well stay in English. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. But you know what, Kanze? Yes. I want you to be able to speak uh, Swahili wherever you can. No Just problem. put it in somewhere. Okay. Because your Swahili is impeccable. Oh <laughs> my God. You. Thank you. It's amazing. Thank you. And we love what you do. Thank you very you much. You do a marvelous job. Now, a lot of people just see you up there, yes. and they know this Kanze, beautiful, tall, wonderful uh, Swahili lady. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's really amazing. 
But you know, we want to know where cancer is coming from. Mm -hmm. You told me a few things about your struggles. Yes. And, and I believe that a lot of people will be delivered today. Yeah. Because you see, uh, when people see you up there and they see you, you know, really just doing some powerful things, they have no idea <laughs> that, that there's another side of the oh, story. Yes. And that's where I want you to start. I want you to flow and just let us know who is Kanze and where did you begin? Ah, okay. Uh, well, I can say that I was brought up by a single mother. Her name is Jane Mebundadena, the late, passed on eight years ago. And um, I don't know how to place it. I'm kind of a firstborn and a thirdborn and a fourthborn. It's kind of complicated. <laughs> so, <laughs> we but are, I'm we a are, born. We, we have the kind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I'm a born because I'm, I'm like the fourth child to my mom. Uh, she had an, an earlier marriage where she had three sets of children. Then I came next. Okay. So I was number four. Yeah. And to my father, I'm the first one. Okay. So I kind of play both roles. The fourth and first. Fourth, fourth okay. and first. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. But I thank God that we are all able to fit in as a family. So okay. that's, that's great for me. Right. And I don't have to choose sides. Yes. Um, I grew up mostly a part of it in Mombasa and part of it in Nairobi because my mom was working in Nairobi. Um, I went to school in Embu. I was there for I think eight years. I was in primary school in a very beautiful school called Kianjo Kumambondi. Eh? We used to call it Kianjo Kumambondi. What? <laughs> no, 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 no. Kianjo Kumambondi. Kianjo Kumambondi. You, 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 you can't just say Kianjo Kumambondi. No, no, no. You have to put the Kianjo Kumambondi <laughs> <laughs> for it to come out. But now it's known as St. Matthews. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> it graduated to St. Matthews. Then yeah. I went to high school in Kenny Girls, still mm -hmm. in Embo. So I was pretty much in, in Embo most of the time. Okay. Yeah, so when we talk about um, uh, the self esteem issue that I need to talk about. Yes, yes. It actually that's began when I was in primary school, transition from being a girl to adolescence. Right. I tended to mature much earlier than my peers in my primary school. Uh, so why is that? You know, I, th I guess God just wanted me to grow faster. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I believe so. Yeah. So, um, actually, when I was growing up as a child, I had problems with my feet. So, at one particular point in time, I even had casts because uh, uh, they kind of wedge in a way. Mm. So, as time went by, they kind of tried to straighten up because of the therapy that was being given, but that didn't work out uh, completely. Okay. So, by the time I was becoming a teenager you know that's when you start beginning to realize I need to walk like who this you are I need to stand you are. like this yeah. you know and all that yeah and uh, I was developing quite fast which means uh, my frontal area was protruding faster than my other peers so I would tend to you know like to walk with us too because I thought it was abnormal why was it only happening to me and not to the other girls so I would walk like that and that would make me now walk with a stoop then I had my feet which were kind of bow and everything so being in a boarding school which was mixed, sometimes you'd walk by and the boys would laugh at you and you know. So I'd always have those issues of I would not want to walk when people are, walk, are looking at me and stuff like that. So it was quite a bit, I think that was a place where it began to escalate, where I began now to think like, you know, I'd never be able to be the kind of girl that all the boys want to be because, you know, really, I walk in a stoop, I have bad legs and all that. So wait a minute. You are stooping like this because there were yes. boobs growing and yes. you didn't want anybody to no. see. Because <laughs> all my other peers in the class didn't have boobs. <laughs> so I was kind of wondering what's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. But other than that, and uh, what I, I sought to do was I would cocoon into my own world. Um, I'm a thespian by talent. Talanta okay. yenye mugo menipatia. Okay, please don't get a look at my lewa. Okay, I... Um, I mean, I discovered that I'm an actress, or I can act rather well. So during primary school, we used to have what you call mashairi, yeah. and, and uh, uh, yeah, for music festival, right. basically. Yeah. So I was really good at them, so I'll throw myself at them, and that would be my way of winning my approval amongst my peers, mm -hmm. because then I would not be approved for who I looked like. So, um, which I pretty much did well, and then I really liked fighting the boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, you were fighting them for. I because guess it was just at you. Yeah, you and just let them know that, you know, you can't, yeah, you know, you just can't laugh at me. Whatever yeah. you can do, I can do better. You know, just trying to get a place to fit in. Right. Because I kind of felt that I was not fitting in. Right. So I tried, so I used to fight the boys, and my mom really got, used to get really mad about it. But for me, it was just my way of making them feel like, you, you're fine, laugh, but you, tutakutana. I will deal with you. Yeah, tutakutana. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I slowly graduated to that and uh, of course when you come back home and people are home in holidays and they're dressing in all these nice trousers and jeans, I could just see how my legs look bad. Um, 
Mm. And so I would tend to always wear long dresses, like for example, what I'm wearing <laughs> today, <laughs> you know, or wow. always be in a lesson. And that transmitted until I went to high school. So right. you're meeting boys from high school and everything. And yeah. uh, you still hide yourself in those things to find a place to be in. Yeah. And uh, actually in high school is when I began drinking alcohol because I wanted to fit in. Though, you know, there were friends who were drinking and they looked cool. So you might as well so join the party. So I might as well join the party. Right. Yeah. So I began to drink in high school, uh, which pretty much moved on up until I, after I finished from four. Mm. And I began working. I was working as a waitress. Um, so that pretty much moved on. So it was just about, I think uh, most of the things I was doing so that I could be able to fit in. To be because accepted. Because I didn't believe in myself and to be accepted. Right. I didn't think I was good enough for anything. You thought first and foremost you didn't have good legs, you no. weren't beautiful. No. And you just didn't like yourself. Yes, I just didn't like myself. Can't say you. Yes. Beautiful <laughs> as you are with this flawless skin. Are you serious? Oh, we thank God now. <laughs> <laughs> but it uh, was hard. Yeah? Yeah. So t tell me. Uh, how, how did the, the low self-esteem begin apart from the legs yes did you grow up with a father no uh, my dad was not there mm -hmm. for the better part, part of my life I just thank God that I got to meet him mm. uh, after many many years with his family yeah but I think also um, because I kind of had a memory because he left when I was about four years old and I kind of had a memory and you know there's one thing about us children I guess and us girls because we're told we are always daddy's girl yes yes there's always a question I kept asking myself did my mom did my father leave because of me you know did I have something to could do I have did they fight over me or something yeah. of the sort and I sort of question I could ask my mother so I kind of developed everything in my mind so even when I finished fourth form and I said working as a waitress and you know being a waitress you get to meet very many people right and People who will uh, look at you and say, oh, you're beautiful, you're smart. And I'm like, okay, really, really? Oh, my. Um, and you kind of still doubt that. And like there's a song that used to be sung our days mm. where it would be say, looking for love in all the, long, the wrong places. Right. right. Home, yeah. <laughs> in all the wrong places. <laughs> yeah. And uh, basically what happened is I did get into a relationship with someone and then I got pregnant. Um, this time you're a teenager? You no, were no. young. I had just finished fourth form. Okay. And I was working as a waitress. It was about, I think, three or four years after I cleared form okay. four. I was okay. working as a waitress. Yeah. Um, and so I felt like, wow, I finally found somebody who actually appreciates me. Appreciates me is the word. <laughs> See, that's the, the danger of yes. low self esteem. Yeah. You always want somebody to whisk you out mm -hmm. of that. Yes. But you see it within. Yeah. Nobody can help you here. No. Without. Yeah. They're gonna, the most they can do is misuse you. That's true. And dump you. That's true. You know, but you have to change from the inside. Exactly. When it comes to low self esteem. That's true. Yeah. So, so you are now looking for love in and then all the wrong places. Yeah. And so I got pregnant. So I mean, when you get pregnant, everybody disappears. So here I was. Including the one who impregnated Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So now you're facing life all alone. And I was thinking in my mind, so, actually when they say I'm a failure, yeah. this is exactly what I am. Here I am pregnant. Um, I don't have a steady job. It was just a waitress job. It was mm -hmm. a transition for me to go to college. My mom is a single parent struggling. I'm such a great disappointment to her, you know, having finished high school and now now my mother. So basically, I think my life had, I felt like my life had come to an end. Right. So um, what I did, because I, I was not able to go and tell my parents or anyone at home about it, I hid it. Um, so I would carry out my chores. I'm sent to go carry water, I go. I'm sent to go do what I go. I was just, I keep saying it's just God who took me through that pregnancy. Oh my gosh. So, and soon after I found out I was pregnant is when now my mom enrolled me into college. So there was no way I was going to tell her that I'm going, not going to go to college because I was pregnant. Of course. Because she'd be very disappointed. So I did go in and do a secretarial course. I was able to do it throughout. At the same time is when I realized there's no way I'm going to go home with this child. It's not going to happen. So I worked with the Youth for Christ, then crisis pregnancies. Right. And I got to sign forms and go through counseling so that they would be able to adopt my child. And I was going to do it in total secrecy. Right. Um, but God had other plans. Mm. I just say God had other plans because the day when I went to deliver, um, it didn't happen. And my mom checked in. My friend actually sold me out. The friend that I used to go with for counseling at Youth for Christ. Told your mother? Yeah, she She's just went and told my girl. mother. <laughs> Listen, we like she, her. Eh? She actually <laughs> went and told my aunt. Yeah. She was n that by then working near by Pumwani Hospital mm. at the Kenya bus station right. and the stage offices. And she just went and told her, so um, 
Kansi has a stomach ache and I've left her at Pumwani Hospital. So, because she also didn't know how to say it. Right. So, I'd already delivered my daughter and wow. I, I had gone to have a bath and I came back and when I walked in and got to my bed, I saw my mother and my aunt. Did you faint? Oh yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, as I, and as I was hearing people calling, I was saying, oh God, please tell me I'm in heaven. <laughs> because I knew when it was dead. going to be. Yes, yeah. you know, and just looking at my mom, disappointed she was. Yeah. More so she was disappointed because I had hidden it from her. Because she was like, am I su that bad a mother, such a bad mother that you couldn't talk to me? And all I could tell her was that I didn't want to disappoint you. Yeah. I didn't want to look like I had failed you yeah. and all those kind of things. So then I get into this new role of being a young mother. And I was also doing my final exams for secretarial. So three months, um, she was called Natasha. So three months after Natasha was born, she just woke up one day at night. Um, by that time, my mom had gone up country with her so that I was able to concentrate and do my exams. And so I was just called and I was told, you need to go home. And no right. one told me what was wrong. So here I was, I went shopping. I was just beginning to get into my role and accept and say, you know, this has already happened. I'm a mother. I'm a mother. Yeah. I, I need to move on from where I'm at. Right. Gave all my all in my exams so that, you know, someone would call me for a job as a secretary. Um, so I get home and I get the news that my daughter is dead. What? So the first thing that came into my mind was like, okay, God, I'm such a bad mother. Should I have been with my daughter at this particular point in time? Did my daughter die because I wasn't around? Was it because I was not breastfeeding her? Mm. All those questions just suddenly came back. And yeah. all that doubting myself and my capabilities. So the loss of esteem yeah. was now injected into yes. a thousand percent if there is Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Um, wow. So I was like, so I failed, I failed, you know, God, are you punishing me because I wanted to give away this child uh, for adoption and so you've chosen to take her away. Mm. That really destroyed me off. for quite a bit. Right. Yeah, For almost a year, all I could do was lock myself up in the room and just cry and just feel like I was not worth anything. So you went like through depression? Yes, I did go through a bit of depression. Yeah. The good thing is that I was able to cover it up a lot. So I would always be in my room in closed doors crying and anyone who would come in and say, I'm reading. I'm reading, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I'm sini sumbwe na soma. Yeah. I'm sini soma. Mama, I'm sumbwe. I'd skip my meals and I'd say, Mie, si likula kitambo, nye kabla mjepika mi likuwa nishakula. But I would go even for days without. So, it was even difficult for anybody around me to realize that there was something going on. Because then I didn't want again to feel like I was being a burden to anyone. Oh my God. The Daughters of Zion Convention is going to be happening from the 25th to the 30th of August this year. Last year we had a revolutionary time together with the Daughters of Zion. It was just awesome. It was amazing. And guess what? This year we are taking it even higher. Dr. Cindy Trim... Pastor Esther Obasike, I tell you, and many others are going to be in the house and we are going to have an awesome time. You don't want to miss it for anything. The registration is ongoing right now as we speak. It's only 2,500 shillings for a life transformation. You better register now. And you know what? Invite all your friends because no life will be left the same again. Register for Daughters of Zion Convention this year, August, be there. Ningependa kualika kinadada wote waje katika mkutano wa Daughters of Zion. Kosa uchekwe.
like you're watching Woman Without Limits, Kanzi Dena is unbelievable. Wow. Uh -huh. yeah. So around that time is when I had my first attempt to take away my life. Suicide. I had, Are you yeah. <laughs> so one day I woke up and I said, I think I've had enough. So I took a paper bag and it took me paper bag and I put it over my head and I tied it and I held it. So, um, so I, I was hoping that I'll suffocate because you know you see these things everywhere that you know you put a paper bag over your head you'll suffocate. So I waited, I wait, and and I continued tightening the the paper bag and tightening the paper bag, and and then somebody knocked on my door and it was my mother. So she was like, "Where be Tracy? Where be Tracy?" And I, I I had to respond to my mom, so I had to remove the paper bag and hide it quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I went and my mom was like, you've been in this room the whole day, what's going on? I'm like, ah, mini kotu. There's nothing going on. I, I was able to cover it so well. So you were very good at covering? Very good. <laughs> very good. Yeah. I, I was really good at it. So that was the first time I attempted to, uh, to take away my life. And then slowly by slowly I figured I'd rather throw myself back into acting because then it would help me forget and not think about anything else. Right. And that's about the same time I gave my life to Christ when I joined Nairobi Baptist Church. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, uh, wow. So when I joined Nairobi Baptist Church, yeah. um, I went into the drama group. I got into praise and worship. It was good. Are you telling anybody about your issues or you're just no. covering them up? I covered them up for a while until yeah. I joined a Bible study that was then being led by uh, Levina Munengi Molandi, okay. uh, Mr. Molandi's wife. Right. And so that's where I was now able to open up to my friends and tell them I did have a daughter and she passed away and it, kind, it killed me inside. So just being a part of this group and not being able to spend time on my own because then we had practice, we had all these things I needed to think. So I kept myself at least busy. Right. Uh, moving over, I got my job at KBC. Uh, and and then, I was, I was, then I was reading news on radio. I had just finished my college and I was in for internship. How did you get on to that? By the way, a lot of people with a low self-esteem, they never really uh, climb up yes. the screen, ladder. Screen How did was you? Not Screen was not my option. Even right. when I went to college, screen was not my option. Um, what I've not told you that I never even thought I'd ever be reading news or even be in this industry in the first place. I wanted to become a nurse. So when I cleared from four, the only thing I knew was I didn't want an eight to five job. Right. I needed something that does shifts. So I looked at it and I said, I nurses do shifts. I didn't know that then that journalists also do shifts. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> by then, so wow. um, I tried getting into KMTC. It didn't work out. So eventually I went to college, then I joined KBC as an intern. Right. And while I was there, the then Hamisi Temo had my voice and he asked me to do a demo for radio. So I did a demo for radio and I was now reading news on radio. So you know reading news on radio, really no one knows and no one sees you. Um, and by that time, I was now beginning to feel that I was doing something because then I was uh, part of Yoja Makamani, Vitimbi mm. and all those kind of programs. So it, it felt good to be with good energy. Right. Um, then I, I was one day called, I was going to do my four o'clock news on radio and I was told someone didn't turn up for TV news. And so I was slotted in to read four o'clock news and that's how I began reading news. Mm. Wow, um, <laughs> yeah. just like that. <laughs> oh yes, but it was, it was, it was quite a, an episode. Yeah. <laughs> because then I didn't know how to operate the auto queue, you know, and all that, but somehow I went through. Yeah, and soon after that, um, I was uh, I was now put on this four o'clock news throughout. Here I was, a villager. I'd never put on makeup in my life. You know all those things. I didn't have a coat. You didn't even think you looked pretty. <laughs> no, I didn't even. I, I was like, would I even make it? What are people seeing? Yeah. When they see me read news, what are they seeing? Yeah. Um, so slowly by slowly, I kind of picked up myself, and things started looking up for the better. Then I got pregnant in the worship team, and in the drama club. Okay. Yeah. In the worship team and in the drama club. In the club. drama club. You all? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, uh, wow. Uh -huh. It all came back again. The mm. failure. How can I do this? Mm. How did this happen? I'm in the drama team. What is everybody going to be saying about me? What are they going to be thinking about me? Mm. I thank God for the Bible study that I was in. Right. Because they helped me. But even though they stepped in to try and hold me and say, you know, you've fallen, but doesn't mean that you stayed down. 
I still felt like I didn't fit in mm. into that group. So I slowly pulled myself Isn't it, out. Look at the way the devil does it. You yeah. know, you know what the devil does is to isolate. Yeah. Because see, when you are alone, he can whoop you nicely, mm. a clean one. <laughs> <laughs> Because you are alone, you're feeling sorry for yourself. He is discouraging you the more. Yeah. He is pressurizing you. He's telling you you are useless. Yeah. That's why you need to go and try and be useful by yourself. By yourself. So, you know? Yeah. And then at the end of the day, he isolates you exactly. and you're all alone. Yeah. And that is when every now, if you thought you had a low self-esteem, it is now welcomed with his mother, mm. father and mm. children. So I, I did pull myself from the Bible study. Mm. And so once again, I was all alone. Um, and uh, here I was, pregnant, you know, how I have failed, really. Is there anything good that can come out from me? First I right. got pregnant when I got out of high school, now I'm pregnant again, yeah. you know, maybe there's just something wrong with me. And uh, so the, the cycle just began again, and um, somewhere when I was about three months pregnant, I kind of almost had what they would call a miscarriage, but apparently I hadn't miscarried. I, I, We've never understood what happened. But what they told you is that you had miscarried? I had miscarried because yeah. I woke up and my bed was full of blood. And so I went to the hospital and they told me, it looks like you've miscarried. We did pregnancy tests and they said it was negative. Yes, they did say it was negative. Okay. And so now again I go back and I say, okay, fine. So now what did I do? What did I do that made my, my, my you baby are now come another out? another baby come out. Yeah. yeah. Can, so I'm losing another baby. The significance of three months. Natasha died at three months. I've lost my pregnancy at three months. So it all came back again. And now I was in campus. And yeah. I was trying to do my degree. I dropped out from campus. Like and there's no point. There's no point. Yeah. I was like, I, I think this is just me. Yeah. So people oh didn't even God. get to know about it much. Mm. And... I would still go read my 7 o'clock news on KBC, come back home and cry and, and just wonder, am I ever going to be a mother? God, am I not good enough to ever be a mother? Those are the kind of questions that just kept coming into my mind. And uh, six months after that, I, I think four, which would have been like now six months of my pregnancy, mm. I started having bad constipation and I'm wondering what's going on. It was ab around December, the festive season. I went to hospital, they told me you have amoeba, so they gave me medicine for amoeba. <laughs> And okay. um, because then I was sporting, so right. then they would rule out pregnancy because then they would ask me when was your last menses and I would tell them last month because I was sporting. Uh, so at seven months, I go in, I have such a bad stomachache, I couldn't, I was crying. I thought I was going to die actually, I thought my stomach was going to burst. So the doctor tells me there seems something hard in your stomach, maybe it's something malignant, let's go and check it. So we go and check and I'm seven and a half months pregnant. <laughs> Did yes. you so I discovered I'm pregnant again. I was in the worship team and I was also in the drama team. So I was in church and I was born again and I was like, really Kanze, you know, you got pregnant the first time, now you're getting again as pregnant at the second time and you're in church, yeah. born again. How much, of a, how much more fails. of a failure <laughs> can you be? Yeah. And um, I thank God for the Dove's Bible study that I was in then mm. because they did work with me. But you know, I still felt condemned within myself. I felt like I had failed them right. as, a, as a member of the Bible study, mm. as a member of the worship team. So what happened is that I pulled myself away. Mm. And I was also in campus at a particular point in time. I, I dropped off. But one of the reasons that made me drop off, drop off from campus was because around the third month of my pregnancy, I woke up one night and when I woke up, my bed was full of blood. So I went to hospital and uh, they told me, Madam, you have miscarried. So here I was again, <coughs> sorry, asking myself, three months again, Natasha died at three months. Here I am losing this baby at three months. You know, what else could go wrong? Right. And so I began to beat myself again. During that period, um, I, asked my, I pulled out myself from the Bible study. I pulled out myself from worship team and drama club. So now I would spend more of my time on my own. And what I would say is that it's, it's work, because then I was working at KBC. Mm. So I would always say it's work, but yeah. the reality was that I really didn't like myself. I really didn't feel like I was worth anything at that particular point in time. And uh, here I was also in a relationship with my boyfriend and it was not working. And I kept feeling, am I not good enough? What is it that I'm not doing right that is not making this relationship work? 
But along the way, which would have been six months now into my pregnancy, which was now around December, I went home for Christmas and I was having bad stomach pains and stomach upsets. I came back to Nairobi and um, I went to hospital and they did a stool test and they said you have very serious amoeba and they gave me medicine for amoeba. And they called it very serious. Yeah, <laughs> they called me very oh serious Lord. amoeba and they, yeah. and they gave me medicine for amoeba. And uh, around a month or two later, which now is around end of January, I woke up, I woke up with some very bad pains. I think that was the time when now the baby was stretching. Mm. So because we didn't know it was a baby, I felt like my stomach was going to burst. So I thought I was going to die. So I rushed to hospital and they felt my, my tummy and they were like, there's something hard, maybe it could be malignant. So we went in for an ultrasound. So we go in for an ultrasound and the lady for the ultrasound just says, hey, yeah, there are the eyes. And I'm like, eyes? Yeah. You know, <laughs> what exactly are we discussing What here? eyes? Yeah. yeah. So you can imagine through this period when I lost my child, I had a misunderstanding with my boyfriend. When I thought I had lost my child, I had a misunderstanding with my boyfriend. And uh, so we were not even in talking terms. So here I am being told I'm pregnant. How do I go back and tell him I'm pregnant? It really didn't make any sense. Mm. Then I remembered, okay, fine. Now I thought I was going to pull myself and get back into worship team and drama because now the child had been lost. Yeah. But then now here I am fighting again pregnancy. So at seven months, I've not done anything. So everything was just helter skelter. Around the eighth month, we received a call from upcountry. My mom was very ill. And she had to be brought to Nairobi. So she was put on a bus and uh, she came to Nairobi. And I was reading news that evening. Um, she was picked by my cousin from Ambassador. And when my cousin picked her up, she, she just kind of fainted and they rushed her to hospital. So when I was finished with news is when I went and I was told, you know, mom is pretty sick. And uh, we start medical tests and everything and we find out that she has colon cancer. But that took time because it was way advanced mm. and uh, her, blood, her blood was not well. It was just her medical issues and she kind of slipped kind of into a coma for some time. Mm. I was eight months pregnant. I had not told my mother I was pregnant. So it, it really worked on me. Um, during that same period, I'm trying to be there for my mother. I was working at KBC then, we were not really being paid much and her being diagnosed with cancer meant that now we had to come up with funds and finances and everything. Um, at, uh, when, she went in for, when she went in to have her surgery, her first surgery, is when I went to give birth. Mm. So for about a few weeks I was not able to see her until she came back home and uh, now we said our, our walk together. For me, that was the blessing, but I still felt like I had still let her down because then here again, I was another child out of wedlock. Unknown to me, which she told me much later, was that she was happy that I'd now had this child and had accepted this child unlike the first child. So we walked wow. this journey together and it's like God just gave her one year to be able to just, for us to be able to cement Aww. our relationship. Aww. And, and make it work. Amen. So unfortunately during the same period is when I was really fighting with my boyfriend and I, I was hoping that we would be able to sort things out. It was such a funny relationship because at one particular point in time he was in a relationship, another relationship and I'm in a relationship. It was just crazy and I felt like I was the reason. I was the reason why this whole relationship was not working. You know, that's, that's so amazing, uh, Kanze, because that's how low self-esteem works. Yes. Low self-esteem makes you blame yourself for, for other people's mistakes. Yeah. You, you carry everybody, even their mistakes, you just put them on you yeah. as a burden because of a low self-esteem. So anything that goes wrong, it can't be anybody else. It has to be you. It's a demonic spirit that's from hell. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, two months after I had given birth to my child and I, I was like, I, was, I had had it, um, was my second attempt at, a, at suicide. Uh, I took a knife, I went into my room and I sat down and I was like, what kind of a mother will I be to this child if I can't give this child a home? It means then I'm not fit enough to be the mother. I was like, God, you've, you've sustained my mom, you'll keep sustaining her to take care of my child. I need to get out of this picture so that everything will work. If this child grows up knowing that their mother died, they wouldn't be as stressed as knowing that their mother was a failure. Life is like a big merry-go-round You're up and then down Going in circles trying to get to where you are Everybody's been counting you out But where are they now? Sitting in the same old place Just faces in the crowd Make mistakes 
The Daughters of Zion Convention is going to be happening from the 25th to the 30th of August this year. Last year we had a revolutionary time together with the Daughters of Zion. It was just awesome. It was amazing. And guess what? This year we are taking it even higher. Dr. Cindy Trim, Pastor Esther Obasike, I tell you, and many others are going to be in the house and we are going to have an awesome time. You don't want to miss it for anything. The registration is ongoing right now as we speak. It's only 2,500 shillings for a life transformation. You better register now. And you know what? Invite all your friends because no life will be left the same again. Register for Daughters of Zion Convention this year, August. Be there. 